All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. All right. So our first speaker of the day is Jared Camp with the Iowa Farm Sanctuary. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Okay, so thank you guys for, uh, for having me out here, um, come and listen to me talk. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, as Phoenix says, uh, I am uh, the co-founder of Iowa Farm Sanctuary. My wife, Sean, and I um, founded the sanctuary back in 2015. And um, at the time, both of us were vegan. We had been vegan for a few years. And we wanted to do something a little bit different aside from just... Uh, not eating animals like we wanted to to really go out and and help animals and you know sean uh read a book about a farm animal rescue and we're like wow like that's got to be something that's here in iowa like that'd be really cool like we wanted to go and volunteer at a farm animal rescue so we looked up uh, online trying to find some farm animal sanctuary here in iowa and to both of our surprises uh there were no sanctuaries at all um, there were no dedicated farm animal rescues in the, in the entire state, which kind of just blew me away. I'm like, how are there sanctuaries on, you know, in California and, and on the East Coast and these not heavy, I mean, they are farmed heavy. At the time, I didn't think they were, but I thought here in Iowa, it's like, there's got to be something here. Um, and there wasn't. In fact, the closest sanctuary to, um, to us in Iowa City was up in Madison, Wisconsin. It was Heartland Farm Sanctuary. And it was about, I think, three and a half hours away. So we decided to, to do a road trip, go up there and kind of see what the sanctuary was like. And um, on the way up there, Sean and I were kind of just tongue in cheek, like, well, maybe we can start our own sanctuary here in Iowa. It's like, I've got a background in, in 4-H and FFA. My family, like they raised animals my entire life. And, you know, my, my high school chores were before I'd go to school were get up and go feed, you know, bottle feed the calves or go feed the goats and go get the eggs for the chickens. And so I'm like, well, it's, you know, it's been a really long time since high school. But I still had some of that knowledge, and um, Sean's got a huge heart. So we were just kind of tossing the idea around, well, maybe we can start our own. Um, so we went up to Madison and went to Heartland Farm Sanctuary and uh, met with the founder up there. And she ended up taking us back to their um, board of directors after we showed quite a bit of interest in um, how they started. And we talked with them for probably a good two or three hours. And... The rest of the ride home, once we were done there, uh, Sean and I decided, you know what, like this is something that we, that we want to do. We want to we wanna start a sanctuary. Um, we didn't know if it'd be successful in Iowa because, you know, one, there's not a whole lot of uh, vegans. Uh, the animal rights movements, um, you know, those people usually get run out of Iowa or, you know, the, the ag industry is pretty aggressive towards them. So we were very hesitant on, on how we were going to be able to do this. Neither one of us have a background in, uh, in nonprofit work. So there was the whole sustainability of like, well, how are we going to sustain this? So with all those very like, skeptical things in our mind, we decided we were just going to try to grow very organically, start small, um, and then just see where it went. Uh, so when we started looking into how much, you know, or what we need to do to get the, uh, the sanctuary up and going, uh, there was a lawyer that said, you know, we have to get our articles of incorporation and, and bylaws quoted us like $4,000 to do that. And we're like, well, it's like our friends and family want to help us out. So we started to GoFundMe page. And then we started a Facebook page. And within two days, the local news called us. And they're like, hey, this is great. Like what you guys are doing is really interesting. Like, can we come and interview you at your farm? Well, at the time, Sean and I were living in a duplex in North Liberty. I'm like, well, we don't have the farm yet, but there's a cornfield right down the, down the street. And they're like, perfect. So our very first interview about the sanctuary was in front of some random cornfield in North Liberty, talking about how we're going to be raising or saving uh, farm animals that are raised here in Iowa. And uh, from that one news story, uh, it just started snowballing. Um, the amount of support that we got from the community was absolutely phenomenal. Um, there was a lawyer at the University of Iowa that decided to do all of our paperwork pro bono for us. The only thing we had to do is pay for just the, the fees from the government. So once we did that, it was just a matter of uh, finding a property um, and, and, and starting that. So we ended up buying our first property in Marengo back in 2016. And of all places, we found it on Craigslist. Uh, so we bought this 10-acre this farm on, on Craigslist in 2016. And then by 2020, we had already uh, pretty much maxed out that property, um, had enough funding that we were able to expand to a 40-acre farm up in Johnson County there in Oxford, uh, Iowa, just outside of Iowa City. 
Um, and since then, we've just been trying to, to keep up with everybody's demands and, and keep up with these animals. And, you know, it's, it's been a wild journey. Um, and we've been doing it pretty much through grassroots, uh, local donations, five, ten dollar donations here and there. Um, but it's, it's, we realized that it was a very important step in, in the animal advocacy here in Iowa. And we've had our struggles through, you know, through the years of, of loss, um, you know, loss of the animals, loss of fights, loss of, uh, you know, trying to get the community to change, trying to get, you know, open people's minds. But it's a struggle worth fighting. Um, and the more and more we do it, the more and more we're ingrained into the community and the more and more that we're able to make a difference. Um, so the, the story I want to talk about today um, Knowing the struggles of, of how to go against such a huge industry, um, it, you know, it, it just seems insurmountable. It seems really difficult, and it seems, you know, pretty much impossible to do, just because all the all the everything's not in our favor. It's all in the favor of animal agriculture. It's in the favor of of those types of mindsets. So what we're doing is really going against the grain. Um, and as much as I just want to shake people and be like, what? Like, how can you not see this? Like, where's your compassion? We realize that uh, trying to get somebody to, to try to change a mind of, uh, of an, especially an adult, um, is incredibly difficult, you know, because all of us have our beliefs, all of us have our convictions because of our past, because of what, um, what we've kind of grown up around and what we've been told and what other people around, around us tell us. And so one of the, uh, one of the approaches that I do um, when, I'm, when I'm trying to change somebody's mind is I try to kind of narrow it down and, and bring it down to an individual level. Um, we've seen that out on the sanctuary where individuals come out and for one reason or another, they, they really get attached to one of the animals and get really invested in their story. And after seeing that happen over and over again, um, I, I see the value in, in kind of bringing up those, those stories of the one, um, of one animal that, that really impacts a, a huge group of people for whatever reason. So the, the one story I want to talk about today is going to be George. Um, George is a, is a pig that was, he was probably about six months old when he, he and there were probably about 60 on the, uh, the transport truck. They were on their way to the slaughterhouse when the back door opened up on the trailer and three of these guys uh, fell out of the back of the, the trailer as they were going down I-80 um, at highway speeds. Um, this happened back in 2019. It was January of 2019. Um, we, uh, we got some phone calls on Facebook about, um, about the uh, transportation accident. And we, Sean and I, we lived all the way in Marengo at the time. So there was no way we could get out on the scene um, right away. So we had some volunteers, a couple of our uh, board members were, were right down the road. And they went out to the scene to see what they could do to help out. Um, the thing is, you know, George, this is a very common thing to happen here in Iowa. Um, a lot of people don't realize, you know, how many uh, pigs are transported and how many actually fall off trucks. It's more rare that these larger pigs are the ones that fall off trucks. Um, typically, it's the smaller ones because they, uh, um, the small pigs, they get transported from the, when they're born to the fattening facilities, usually about 21 days old is when they take them from their mothers and then take them over to a, uh, a, a fattening facility. And at times, depending on the farm they're coming from, they'll transport them in anywhere between 1,500 to 2,000 at a time. And they're putting them all in these trailers that are uh, uh, used for livestock transportation as well, so like large cattle, things like that. And these, uh, the little piglets, when they, when they get scared and when they're in huge numbers like that, what they do is they, they, call, they, they clump together. So a lot of times they'll clump up high enough to where they get to those bigger holes up in the, the taller parts of the, uh, um, the trailer to where they can fall out. A lot of times, kind of like what happened with George and the other two, the, the doors on the back, either the driver or the operator of the semi doesn't close the uh, door well enough or the door just malfunctions as they're going down the road just from all the rattling, and those doors pop open, and ultimately the, the little piglets or the pigs just kind of come out of the back of the truck because they see an exit. Um, and that's, uh, that's what happened in the case of George. Um, we got called out there, and or we got, we got notified. We called our board members, and they went out. 
Um, we did, I don't know if anybody uh, was around back then um, on, our, on our Facebook, we did live stream the entire thing. It was about an hour and a half long. Um, we did that because we've been to multiple transportation accidents and typically law enforcement just tries to run us off the scene. They don't want us there. Um, they, they see, for whatever reason, they see animal rights activists as, as part of the problem. They don't understand that we're there to help, that we want to, you know, be safe and get them the animals out of there as fast as we can because we realize that the police officers and law enforcement they want the same thing they want those roadways open they want those roadways cleared and we want to go there because we know that we're an asset and that we can help out um so we uh um when we got out there we started live streaming um we also knew if we were live streaming the likelihood of the officers uh just basically shooting the animals would be a lot less uh, we've been out on scenes where that's happened um, right up the road in Washington County back in 2019 as well. We had, uh, I'm sorry, it was 20, I think it was 2017 or 2018. There was a semi full of uh, cattle that um, went off the road. Um, the, uh, the driver fell asleep at the wheel. Uh, there were probably about 30 plus um, cows in the back of this trailer. Trailer. He went off into the trees. Um, we rescued the surviving eight out of uh, the rest of them. While we were on scene, um, the police were actively shooting um, some of the loose cattle that did survive the accident, just because they said that they were getting too close to the highway. First responders as well, some of the local uh, um, firefighters went to their trucks and got their guns out and were doing the same thing. Uh, it was just absolutely abhorrent. Um, it's, it was sad. Uh, these animals had just gone through so much already, um, and they had to end their lives that way. Uh, so. We wanted to make sure that we had our live stream going um, just to try to prevent the officers from, um, from going down that same path. Uh, these are two videos from that rescue. Don't worry, there's no, there's no, graphic, um, there's no graphic stuff in these two videos. Um, they're only about 30 seconds long. Um, uh, the three pigs that did fall off the truck, uh, we were able to rescue just George. The other two, one was, uh, was pretty badly wounded. Um, they ended up humanely euthanizing him right away uh, on the scene. Um, and then the third pig, we're not sure what happened to him. The uh, uh, law enforcement let somebody else that was there just load him up in the truck and take him away. Um, so we, we tried to get both of them, um, but the law enforcement, you, you'll be able to hear in the first video, he, uh, uh, really, just, he really just wanted us to, to get out of there. Um, he wanted the pig to get, uh, to get put somewhere and just go. Let me turn this speaker back on. Sorry, my computer's connected to this, so you'll hear the audio through this. Um, so um, you'll hear in this first video, the officer um, basically talking, the, um, they're trying to get the um, Iowa State large animal vets down to, um, to euthanize um, all of the pigs there. And we're pleading with them to try to get the one um, or the two just to go. And you'll hear the officer in here kind of talking about, uh, you know, the, the vets, you know, just left Ames. You guys need to get, we just need to get this road cleared up. Um, let me go ahead and play this. So they open up ISD first and I call attention. So I don't care what they do. As long as they get them off the interstate, yeah. they'll yeah. find an exit ramp. They can sit yeah. and hang out and wait for this dock. Yeah. Hey, that's what's going to need to happen. I mean, it's down here. here I mean, I guess we don't want to go further, so we have to yeah. move in. So just down here off Mill Civic? It's, it's not doing them any good sitting here in the cold either. Yeah. And it, this one's got the ability to run back up on the interstate. Yeah. It's tying us up. We need to get them out of here. Well, ISU should be here within the next 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, they just said he's just leaving Ames. So. Oh. Yeah. You guys are in contact Unless there's with somebody person? else coming. The yeah, large some animal hospital? Copeland or something. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if that's So if you guys have contact, you want to call. Body. Uh, Oops, sorry about that. Shortly after that, we were able to, uh, um, to, get, to get him up to the truck um, and get him to the back of the truck. And this is us. Uh, oops, my goodness. Getting him in the, into the truck and. Uh, Body. Um, 
as you can see, George wasn't a small guy. Um, it took about six people to lift him up and to get him into the back of the, the bed of this pickup truck. Um, Sean was on her way with our, uh, with our van at the time, um, and we just needed to get George off the highway um, and, and get him going. So while we were out there, like, like I say, we were out there for over an hour uh, live streaming this, this whole thing. Um, there was the, the pig that did fall off that was, was really badly injured, was bleeding on the side of the road. Um, there's more of that video where we were just pleading with the officers to let us uh, um, basically get him up to the hospital. And they were refusing to let us uh, like, to get him out of there. Um, they said that he was going to die. Like, they're, I mean, they were yelling at um, our members there, telling us, you know, basically that we just need to leave. Um, but after we were pretty persistent, we were able to help, um, um, help George out. Uh, it just so happened that maybe two weeks after we rescued George, he was still in our quarantine building in our, at our farm, we got a phone call about a little piglet that also fell off of a semi in a completely separate accident. And uh, his name is Guy. And so we had these two new pigs, and we just kind of like, we're like, well, we'll put them together. You know, they're in quarantine. And you'll see in the next video, Guy is, was, I mean, he was a piglet. He was 21 days old. Um, George is six months old. The size difference is pretty pretty impressive. And pigs, uh, I don't know I, how many of you have been around pigs before. Pigs are very difficult to integrate with each other. They have just got some big attitudes. And, and, and so you have to kind of like do it slowly. Like we've, we've learned over the years the best way to get them to come together. Well, with, with George, he was such a docile um, um, pig. He seemed so friendly. You know, there's, I may be biased, but there, there are times that we help these animals out where I, I just see in their eyes where they just they seem to appreciate and they seem to know that, you know, that somebody's helped them out. And we saw that in George, you know, we'd walk in, he wouldn't run away from us. He was always like friendly with us. So we felt pretty confident we could put Guy in there with him, at least to, to help Guy calm down. Cause Guy was very rambunctious as a little one. Um, he was, he seemed scared. So we put him in the room with, uh, with George and immediately they just became uh, best friends. And this is them. Sorry, the video quality is not the best. Oh, there's two piggies there. Oh. There's little guy. <laughs> so since this rescue, George and Guy are their stallmates, their best friends. They are never ten feet away from each other. They follow each other around all the time. Um, but to kind of come back to uh, um, the, uh, the story of one, you know, I say the story of one, but we're talking about Guy. While we were out there in live streaming this video, um, the, the, the response from the community, and we don't have the biggest like social media following, but there was something about this rescue that really kind of grappled or grasped like people's attention and it was really, really like moving for so many people. Um, They're watching it, they're commenting it. Um, after we posted about it on our social media, um, even after the live stream, we had people from around the nation contact us. Um, it was really fascinating, you know, because we've done a lot of rescues before. We've done bigger rescues than, than one pig on the side of the road. But there was something about this one story, or this, this one pig that really, kind of grabbed everybody's attention. Um, we had people in Europe contacting us. Um, there was a news uh, company over there that wanted to uh, talk about this story. Uh, it was just, it was pretty amazing. Um, and, you know, I, it's, I can never like really say what exactly, you know, what exactly it was about George, but there was something about this rescue that really, uh, that really kind of resonated with a lot of people. Um, and since then, you know, we've had people that watched his, uh, watched his rescue live on the internet. They've come out uh, afterwards and they've met George in person. And we've had so many people tell us that the reason they stopped eating meat, the reason they stopped eating cheese, the reason they stopped eating any animal products is because of George. So there's this one pig that, that impacted, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people. 
and we had dozens of people come out to the farm and say, hey, like, you know, George's story was, it was incredible. And he's, he's the reason why I'm vegan. He's the reason why I'm not eating meat anymore. Um, and it's just, you know, I wish that there was a way I could explain to George, like, you know, I'm sorry you went through so much, but what you went through has helped so many people out. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's pretty wild um, that, uh, that his story was able to do that. And we've had that with other, short, with other animals as well. Um, Angel, our little mini zebu cow. Um, Carl, he was our very first Holstein rescue. There's so many people that find these stories with one of these animals so compelling and they can relate with struggles that they have um, during that time. And they, they kind of latch onto these, these stories and it really makes a huge difference. Um, and what's wild about George is that we're in Iowa and there are pigs everywhere in Iowa. Um, there are about 24 million pigs in Iowa, which is about seven, seven pigs to one human. You know, and how many times do you guys see pigs on the side of the road? Especially at this, this amount, you know. It's, you very rarely see pigs on the side of the road. You'll see cow farms, you'll see, you know, those things. But the, the, most of the pigs here are in CAFOs. There, there are thousands of pigs in small, confined areas. Um, in the United States, there's about 74 million pigs in, in the farming industry. And there are about one in every three pigs in the entire United States is in, is in Iowa, you know? And it's just, I mean, it's mind boggling. It, it just, it's just, it, you can't really wrap your mind around how, how many that actually is. Um, so when, when we rescue, you know, one pig out of this, uh, this entire industry, are you guys familiar with the starfish story? I never heard this until a couple of days ago, and my wife was like, just tell, like, use the starfish story. That's very similar. Because it's something similar to what I've said before. You know, like, I, I've talked about, like, these animals, uh, whether it's a cow, a pig, chicken, you know, like, taking one animal outside of, or out of that industry. You know, there's 23 million pigs here, and we rescue one. Like, that's not going to make a difference to the, to the animal agriculture industry, you know. But it's the most impactful thing for that one that one animal um it's the most important thing for that one animal um the starfish story i'm just going to paraphrase i'm not going to read all that basically the you know this and this is just a fictitious story kind of to give you perspective of of what you do and how you can help um a girl's walking down the beach um it's a uh, low tide and there's a lot of starfish that are just scattered across the beach and the sun's coming out um it's going to be really hot that day and this girl is just walking down the beach and just tosses the starfishes in the ocean. Well, a guy sees her doing this and, and walks up and looks down the beach and sees just thousands of starfish. And he confronts her and says, why, why are you doing this? You're not going to make a difference. And she just looks at him, goes and picks up the starfish and throws it in the ocean and said, well, I just made a difference for that one. So that's the way, you know, that's... It's a good analogy to, to what we do um, with, with our animals um, in, such a, in such a struggle against the industry that is so ingrained here within Iowa, is we take these animals out of that industry and we advocate for those animals. And those animals become the, the ambassadors of their species is the way that we see them. So when people come out to visit our sanctuary, they're able to put a face and they're able to put a name with, with that industry. and, and what and, how important it was to get them out of that industry. And it helps them challenge their, their ideas of maybe what, you know, their choices that they're making about what they're putting into their bodies. Um, well, I, I spoke of Carl earlier. He was the very first uh, dairy cow that we rescued. He's the very first cow that we rescued. Um, he came from an auction. And unbeknownst to us, he had a disease from the day he was born that ended up taking his life when he was uh, um, four years old. And um, he had it, he, he gets it within the first 24 hours of, uh, of being alive. It's just from being in um, manure uh, and it just sits in his gut. It's kind of like Crohn's disease is the best way I can describe it. So when they get older, <clears throat> their intestines just start inflaming and they're not able to, to keep all the nutrients. And, and that's ultimately what ended uh, Carl's life. But when, when, when we first had him, he was extremely sick. Uh, and we rescued him right before um, we had an event. And it was like the end event for the year. And we didn't know we were going to have this little cow. We just kind of kept him separate. Uh, but the visitors were able to kind of come and see him. They heard his story. 
And just from that one event, um, I mean, we had five or six people there that immediately stopped eating cheese, uh, immediately stopped eating dairy because they, they put a face with the name of, of, uh, of that industry. So ways that we, uh, the ways that we see that uh, sanctuaries are, are like good advocates for, um, for animal rights and, and just to be, you know, to speak out for, for these animals gives the voice the voice, or the voiceless a voice, rather. Um, we can provide safe haven for these animals. Obviously, we only have 40 acres, and we've actually filled up pretty quick. We have over 145 animals there now. And so we can't, unfortunately, rescue every single animal that we con get contacted about. Sean's amazing. She was able to build uh, a, a kind of a network with a lot of other sanctuaries here in the Midwest, as well as uh, across the, the nation. We've worked with sanctuaries in, land, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, we've worked with Farm Sanctuary in New York, as well as in, um, in California. Uh, we've worked with sanctuaries as far as Florida and Georgia. Um, when, we get it, when we get contact about these animals, we do everything that we can to, to help these animals out. But we know that we've only got a limited space that we can do. Um, and to make sure that we give uh, a safe home to these animals, uh, we can only have so many, unfortunately, at our, at our farm. Um, another thing we do for advocacy, we raise awareness. Uh, we, we do tours um, we, uh, we, every Sunday um, now until probably October, the, about the beginning of October. We do sanctuary strolls. Um, on our 40-acre farm, we have about a mile-long trail that goes around the entire property that people can come out and just walk around at your time, at your leisure, meet the animals. Um, we get a lot of uh, produce donated from Hy-Vee, so we make little treat cups that you can get and, and feed the animals. Um, we're not a petting zoo, and the, there's a huge distinction between us, or a petting zoo and a sanctuary. Um, we don't guarantee that you're going to be able to see the animal you want to see. We don't guarantee you're going to be able to pet one of the animals. We, guarantee, we can't guarantee that you're, you know, that you're not going to be able, or that you're going to be able to feed every single one. The sanctuaries is are, is, are the animals' home. Um, that's their safe place. And so when people come out, they're the visitors at their home. And we leave it up to the animals whether or not they come up to the fence or whether they want to come meet people. And we have some that are incredibly, uh, like, interested in people only because they know they're going to get a treat and they, they become like really bossy and push everybody else around. But then we have other animals that have like, they want nothing to do with, with people. Um, Harold, one of our Highland cows, I, I just want to like struggle, snuggle like the hell out of him, but he doesn't want to be around people at all. He's the cutest little guy, but he just wants nothing to do with people, which is fine. Um, the, the cows that came from the, uh, the semi-accident, the, uh, liberated, all but Max, so there's uh, four of them now. Um, the three just don't want anything to do with people, um, which is fine. Uh, Max is really sweet. He likes, he, he likes people because he knows he gets treats because Sean spoils them. Um, we also do educational programs. Uh, last year, we, uh, we were involved in the LEAP program. Um, LEAP is the uh, Leaders for Ethics, Animals in the Planet. It's an alternative to FFA and 4-H. Um, we have high school students come out uh, and they learn about farm animals and they learn about how to take care of the farm animals and they learn about the ag animal agriculture industry and they learn about the problems that um, the, uh, the agri agriculture industry like um, imparts on these animals. So we give them an opportunity to, you know, because a lot of these kids, um, they want to learn about these animals when they go into 4-H and, and FFA. They're interested in them and they want to help. A lot of them are pre-vet um, students. And, you know, they, at the end of 4-H, they, a lot of times they take the animals to, to slaughter. They sell them at the auction. And we've rescued a, a handful of those, those animals uh, that, you know, to keep them out of the, uh, the, the slaughterhouse where these students or these kids that raise these animals throughout the year, they don't want to see them die. They don't want to know that they die. And so we were, we were fortunate. We were one of, uh, one of a few sanctuaries across the nation that the LEAP program was, uh, was started at. And, you know, it was, it was phenomenal. We're going to do it again this year. Um, we had such a good success with it. Um, the, the students really enjoyed it. And so we're looking forward to do that again. Um, you know, we promote the, the ethical, like I was talking about before, when, when people come out um, and meet these animals, you know, we try to promote, like, this, this ethical lifestyle change of, you know, 
cheese isn't as, as amazing as you think, like Carl and, and Connor and Calvin and Irby, these are all victims of the dairy industry where these, these male cows are taken away from, from their mothers right away. I mean, days old. We, we just rescued a little baby. Uh, his name's Asher. He was born a week ago today. And we rescued him when he was three days old um, from a farm up in Wisconsin because he has some um, tendon tightness in his front legs. But the, uh, the people they sell these little milk dairy calves to, they won't take them. Um, so they were just going to kill them there on the farm. That's the same place that we uh, rescued Tay. That's the, the same place we rescued Calvin and Connor. Um, and these places just, they, they sell these little babies by the hundreds. And the ones that are either too small or they have deformities, they, the, the people won't buy them. And they'll just kill them on site. Um, so when we tell these stories, you know, it, we, we try to plant the seed in people's minds of like, wow, you know, like, do I really want to support an industry that does that? Um, we uh, we try to challenge the uh, try uh, try to challenge the norms, uh, which you know, surprisingly, here in Iowa, I, I expected us to have more of a fight with with farmers and more of a fight with um, with the industry. And to be honest, like we have so many local farmers around us that tell us, like they're like, wow, what you guys are doing is amazing, but they have this cognitive dissonance and this disconnect because they equate what we're doing with what they're doing because they're a family farm. They're like, we love our animals too. We take care of our animals. We are not part of the bad side. And all I'm thinking in my head is like, yeah, you love them until the day you don't, until the day you put a, you know, the, the knife to their neck or the, the gun to their head. And that's the fundamental difference between, you know, a, you know animal rights and, and, and animal advocacy versus the farming industry because they they're so brainwashed to think that they're you know, that they love these animals and I, and I do think that they probably care for them they just don't see these animals as sentient beings they don't see them as individuals they just see them as a product so we try to challenge the norms by by giving these animals uh, um, their own voice and and their own stories for people to come and and meet them um, and then you know like I say we we try to plant the seed um, we don't wag our finger, finger at people and be like, you're wrong. I mean, we do when, when they're really wrong, like with the, uh, a couple of the rescues. But a lot of times we just try to um, give them the information, you know, because I I'm, I'm firmly believe that there's no way that you can win an ethical argument with a vegan. Um, and maybe that's just me being biased. Like, I, I think that when you talk about animal rights and animal welfare and to be an advocate for these animals, I just don't think that there's an ethical argument of when it's okay to take the life of another being because of your palate pleasure. It just, I mean, there's just no sense in that to me at all. Um, so we try to just plant the seed of, of, of our side of understanding of these animals and then com combine that with giving people the opportunity to come meet these animals and see them in a, in a, in a light that's outside of, of the farming industry. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what I have. Um, if you guys don't follow us, uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and apparently we're on TikTok as well. I just found that out. I don't do any of our social media at all. Um, I rarely even show up in social media. Um, I want to I end this on, on a quote um, that I found the other day um, to kind of wrap up the, the um, power of one. And uh, the quote is, one to change a few, a few to change many, many to change the world. And it all starts with one. Thank you guys very much. I don't have any que if you guys have any questions, please uh, go ahead and ask. Yeah. Um, I'm glad to hear that because I've had some very traumatic animal experiences lately. And that's uh, very difficult to deal with. And uh, so, um, uh, I'd like to go out there and have people that help. I, there are a whole bunch of animal issues. I mean, like, that are really seriously important. You know, bad vets and the whole thing. Uh, yeah, we've, we've had our struggle with vets. Um, we've, uh, yeah, we've, we have a lawsuit right now with, like, Mizzou for killing some animals that we were involved in rescuing. Um, we've been asked not to come back to, to veterinary schools, uh, at, at the hospitals, I should say, not even the schools. Uh, We've had hospitals that have uh, tried to 
not get us to come back because their first line of treatment a lot of times is, we'll just euthanize them. Or like, no, like, how about we try to help them? And um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, how can I say this politely? There's a lot of problems in the, in the veterinary, like, large animal hospital community. There, there's a lot of lines that are blurred between the, the, the facility or the staff at the um, schools in their personal interests and then um, kind of like the philosophical differences that we have with, with animal care. Um, we're willing to go a long way and do whatever it takes to help these animals out because they're part of our family. Um, we've, had so, uh, we've had some of the vets tell us that our money is better spent on a healthy animal and they're trying to tell us how to like spend our money on the care of our animals. So yeah, we've we've run into a lot of issues with uh, not not just the you know, I mean with fundamental institutions like large animal hospitals. So the struggle is real. So um, and do you if you see an animal that's not well, or even with, if you do rescues that you can you can call you and talk about it and so forth. Yep, we are. We try to help out as many as we can. Um, like I like I said, you know, we're we're really limited on the space, um, and some of the uh, um, and there's just so many animals. You know, when we started this, I've so many people ask me like, "What well, are like, how are you going to get animals? Like, farmers make money on these animals." I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, "God, I don't know." Like, it's a really good question. But after talking with some other uh, sanctuary founders, they're like, "Don't worry. Like, people will call you. You're going to get inundated with phone calls." And I'm I was very skeptical at first, but it's true. I mean, we get phone calls nearly every week. Um, the uh, one thing I didn't touch on that I was going to is uh, after we rescued George and after we rescued a lot of other pigs off the side of the road here in Iowa, Iowa actually changed their laws. Um, we're not sure if it was because of us, but we did get a lot of like kind of press and, and some notoriety from doing these rescues. But the laws were changed now to where if you guys find if anybody finds a, a little piglet on the side of the road, if you call law enforcement, law enforcement has to immediately call the state vet who will send a local vet out and they'll euthanize the pig, regardless of if there's any injuries or not, regardless if there's a rescue organization that's there willing to help that animal out, the law says that they have to kill those animals, uh, kill the pigs specifically. They're not allowed to go anywhere else. Um, Iowa City PD, they, they found a little piglet, or somebody called and told them about a little piglet on, on I-80, just downtown, and um, the officer went up there, was able to find the piglet, took him down to the Iowa City Animal Shelter. Uh, the officer took a picture of the pig in the front seat of the police car, and the shelter called us, and we knew that this law was like either in place or it was close to being in place, and we're just like, all right, don't post anything about it. We're going to come pick this little pig up. Uh, and we went and picked her up, and um, the police officer posted on Iowa City PD's like Instagram this little like you know it was a really good little post about them helping this piglet on the side of the road, and somebody in the in the state saw that, and they called Iowa City PD up and they said, "Where's this pig at? This pig needs to be euthanized." And they're like, "Wait, why? This pig's at a shelter, and there's a rescue that's going to help him." And they're like, "Nope, this pig has to be euthanized. You need to get that pig back." So we were able to, we were still able to rescue the pig. Um, we had to quarantine the pig for 30 days um, at the cost of, you know, I, I always say the animal shelter was actually the one that quarantined the pig, kept her there um, for 30 days. Um, they had to do these vaccines and all these other shots just to make sure this one pig was able to, uh, to get to their forever home. Um, but now, yeah, we don't, we used to get phone calls all the time from highway patrol or uh, local sheriff's departments about pigs that are like found on the interstate. Um, and now if they actually get phone calls, they have to call the state vet. So we don't get them nearly as much. Um, we do still get some phone calls about them, and we do try to help them out as much as we can. Yes, ma'am. Do you know when that bill was passed and what the bill number was? I don't know the exact. Uh, I know it was about two years ago um, that we've been dealing with it. Um, but, yeah, I don't know the exact uh, um, law that it was, or the bill, rather. Thanks. Uh, we have, I think, like 147, right around there. And uh, is it like, do you let them breed or no? Nope, no, none of our animals uh, um, are bred. We actually, any male animal that we get in, we, uh, um, we neuter them. 
Um, the pigs that we have, like any new like female pigs that we get, we'll, we'll uh, um, spay them. And that's more so, um, uh, so that they don't develop uh, uterine cancer. Because um, as those pigs grow, they're just full of hormones and, and they're known to, um, to potentially develop cancer. Not all of them do, but the risk is pretty high. Um, pretty sure like most sanctuaries don't let animals breed. No, no. We have had a couple accidental, well, surprise births. I shouldn't say accidental. They were surprise births. Uh, the one most recently was in April of this year. So we rescued Mo, which is a miniature horse. Um, she was an accidental rescue. We actually uh, rescued her with a bunch of other animals. We were facilitating moving them from Wisconsin to a bunch of different sanctuaries. And we don't rescue horses. There's a lot of horse rescues around. Um, we try to like focus solely on what people consider food animals. And so when we brought Mo in, uh, we're like, well, we're just going to hold her for now until this other sanctuary out east will be able to come pick her up. Um, so all the other animals we rescued, we were able to get them to go to their forever sanctuaries. And the sanctuary that uh, wanted Mo, um, they ended up backing out of the, uh, the rescue. So we're like, oh, Mo's here. She's been here for a few weeks. Like, she's getting along with the animals. So we'll just, you know, we'll keep her here. That was June of last year. Well, April of this year, I go out to the barn, and I'm walking by her stall, I'm like, why is there a goat with Mo? And I'm like, that's a bushy tail. I'm like, oh my God, it's like, that's a baby horse. I come to find out horses gestation lasts uh, anywhere between tw uh, 10 to 12 months. So she was pregnant and we had no idea. And we, we um, don't typically like, get pregnancy checks on a lot of the animals. If they come from um, big rescues, like the Washington County neglect case that we had, um, we did get a lot of them pregnancy checked um, just because we didn't know anything about them. But this one horse, you know, we had, you know, no, no idea. And she's the only horse we have on the sanctuary. So as she's like getting later and later in her gestation, she's obviously gaining weight. And we're talking to them like, man, Mo's getting fat. We need to cut her food back. So <laughs> for the last like month, we started like not feeding her as much because we, we didn't know why she was getting so big. Uh, but yeah, once we found a little baby horse inside of her stall, uh, Lux is her name. Uh, we're like, oh, that makes sense why she was uh, gaining weight. So, but uh, yeah, so we've we've had some, a couple of births there. Um, well, there's the other one was uh, Fawn. She was a little goat. Um, she came from a group of uh, goats from Pennsylvania that we rescued, and they had all got pregnancy checked. We were told, and then um, we went out one day, and there was an, a little baby goat with uh, with Kathy, and <laughs> so. The, the, those are the only ones. But yeah, we don't, we don't breed any of our animals. Um, and yeah, I don't know of any sanctuaries that do. I don't know if they're, yeah. No, there's, there's plenty of animals out there that need help. We don't need to, to raise our own. Yes, sir. What type of work do you most need help with uh, volunteering at your location? Um, we just hired two employees to help us, like basically like clean the stalls. Um, a lot of that, so there's kind of a couple things, like just the daily chores is the biggest one. And the daily chores uh, um, are mucking of the stalls. And then we also do like spa days for our animals. So where we need to like trim their hooves or cut their hair or, you know, we have to get fecal samples from them. So we have like volunteers that walk around and really selling this whole volunteer thing. Come clean their poop and then grab their poop with bags. That doesn't happen that often. Um, but there's, there's just like a lot of daily operations stuff that we do. Matt over here, Matt's one of our volunteers. Um, he, he comes out and helps a lot. He can attest a lot of that. But, but yeah, mainly it's just a lot of the uh, um, um, just daily chores of like cleaning their stalls and, and cleaning up around the, the property a little bit. Um, we do have like on our stroll days, um, the volunteers have been out there a bunch. We do trainings for the volunteers if they want to help out on the stroll days to to stay with like a group of the animals and, and kind of answer questions for people that come up that are visitors and they want to know more about them. Um, so we do that as well for a lot of the volunteers that come out frequently. Yes? Oh, so uh, could I visit, uh, you can visit other certain days? Yep. So um, we do private tours and we do our sanctuary strolls. So every Sunday um, from now until October, um, we do sanctuary strolls from uh, one to three. And so that's, uh, we just ask for a $10, or maybe it's a $12 donation now for adult to come out. Um, and then you can come out and stay for those three hours and walk around and meet everybody. Um, and then private tours, uh, they're, uh, um, they're, that's a more intimate like um, 
uh, way to meet the animals. Um, with, the, with the sanctuary strolls, you have to pretty much stay on the outside of the fence um, and kind of go around. With our private tours, uh, uh, one of our lead volunteers, Kevin, he will take you around and meet all the animals. Um, Sean and I will help out with those tours sometimes. Um, but you'll be able to go into the, uh, um, into the pastures with them. Not the big cows. The big cows are um, too big and they're too risky. But um, you'll be able to go in with, uh, with like all of our, what we call our misfit pasture. Um, a lot of our animals with, uh, with disabilities. Um, you'll be able to go in there and meet them. Um, and that's just, uh, it's uh, $200 for up to 10 people for the private tours. Yes. Okay, so you didn't mention this, but I've been following you for a while, so I know you have a gift shop. Who makes all that stuff? Um, we, well, we come up with those designs, and then we use a local uh, um, guy there in Iowa City. Um, he does all of our printing and everything for us, so. Okay, um, I actually bought some soap. Oh, the soap? Um, Gosh, we've gotten soap from a few different um, people um, that have done soap for us. Uh, was it the uh, one with Angel on it? Yeah. Um, I forget. Uh, Sean would know. Um, uh, but I forget the name of the company that did that for us. Uh, but yeah, we've had a company in Park City, a coffee roaster, make us coffee, like Angel's Coffee. So um, I forget the name. It was a really clever, like, moo roast or something. But, yeah, we – do you? <laughs> yeah. That's good, yeah. Yeah, deja vu. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yes. Are you um, are you do you work internationally uh, to help expand your trails um, and other pictures? Um, unfortunately, we don't. Um, we have our hands pretty much full here, um, just with with Iowa. Um, as much as we would like to, um, we do. Like I said, we've had people from Europe um, contact us about the stories that that make the news here. Somehow they make, I guess, the power of the internet um, reaches over there. Um, but th that's about the extent of what we do. Um, we don't actively go and, and help organizations out over there. Um, one, I just don't know enough about it. And two, we're, like I say, we're still pretty, pretty busy here in Iowa. I still work full time as a paramedic. Um, I joke with people like that's my easy job. I can start IVs and do CPR like all day long, but like taking care of the animals, that's, that's the actual like real work and the, and the hard work for it. So, it's a very big operation that we have, and I know it takes a lot of money to do that kind of stuff. Can you talk about how you do your fundraising and, and how you're able to actually make this, you know, very viable? Yeah. Yeah, if I would have known how much it was going to, like, cost at the very beginning, I think that I probably would have been even more discouraged. Um, right now, our uh, um, average operating cost is right around $30,000 a month. Um, for the animals that we have. Um, that includes healthcare, food, um, facilities, and um, being kind of a niche nonprofit that we are, we don't meet a lot of the requirements for, for the big grants that are out there. Um, the biggest grant that we've ever received was from Tractor Supply, and I don't even know, it's kind of a stretch to say it was a grant. It was more of a popularity contest where you, um, you submit a picture of one of your rescued animals, and then the, like, people vote, and the winner gets a $25,000 check. So naturally, we are like, Angel's going to win this. Um, so we submitted a picture of Angel. Um, Angel is one of our little mini zebus uh, who doesn't use her back leg. She's got a wheelchair that um, she used to use. She doesn't use it anymore, but that's how she would get around. Um, so um, what we do um, online is we have sponsorship programs to where you can sponsor an animal, um, whether it be monthly or yearly. You can choose whichever animal you want to sponsor. Um, so that helps us out. Uh, same thing, we have a Patreon um, where people pay monthly for that. They get kind of um, special like posts and things and, and information about the animals. We try to make that as exclusive as we can. And then we do just our, our Sunday strolls, um, get people out there. We do some pop-up events throughout the year. We, did, we just had our very first like uh, opening fundraiser, the Spring Picnic. Um, we'll do a camp out later this year, and then we do our uh, uh, 5K in October is our, like our closing fundraiser. Um, but a lot of it is just, I mean, like I say, it's grassroots, um, five, ten dollar donations here and there. Um, and then, you know, we we just try to get people involved, and, and social media is a, is a huge thing. Um, I don't know how people were successful with nonprofits before social media. Is that's just like a huge thing for us, and that's where we get a lot of our funding and, and money from. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Have you ever, <laughs> have you ever like had someone come and they thought it was an actual farm? Oh yeah, yeah. We've we've had people. Um, like I said, we've had people come out and they're like. They, they don't they don't know what a sanctuary is we, we've had I've, a lot of people just kind of like randomly show up they see cars in our parking lot and they'll just stop by um and yeah they'll they'll just they think that we're like a normal farm or they think that we're a petting zoo um we get a lot of questions of like well what do you guys do when they're dead like when when they die like do you guys sell them do you like sell them meat to like food pantries and we're like no no like we are as respectful as we can like we'll you know, either either bury them or we get them cremated. Um, but yeah, it, it's just like I say, it's it's something that's so out of the ordinary for people around um, that they just it's kind of hard for them to comprehend. But we do have a lot of signage up a, along the trails, so I mean, we're not we're not afraid to like pass our vegan message along um, there at the farm. Um, everything that we have out there is you know we we talk about like animal agriculture a lot. Um, if anybody shows up to the farm with, with any, like, dairy products or anything, we just kindly ask them to either leave it in their car or they can leave. Um, we've had a couple people um, where pretty, they're family members that, you know, people are always embarrassed about some of their family members, and these are them. Like, we had a guy show up with, a, with one of those PETA shirts, the people eating tasty animals, you know? Like, we've asked people to, you know, be respectful and, and wait in the car and things like that, but... Fortunately, we've never had any like major, you know, any incidents or anything like that. Yeah. Um, you know, like California is probably good. Um, there's really, there's really not a whole lot. I mean, it's I say it's good. It's better than some places. Um, the 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 animal welfare laws for farm animals really lack um, any substantial um, merit. Uh, a lot of people, if you know, one, most of them are just like serious misdemeanors, is what they'll call them, um, and they and they're they're based off of herds too. So, the the Washington County rescue that we had um, last year or the year before, where we rescued you know goats and pigs and and sheep, where there were thousands of dead animals there over the years. There were skeletons, there were bones, there were dead bodies, there were dying bodies. Uh, when when we pursued that, um, the uh, the farmer was charged with one count of seri a serious misdemeanor for animal neglect, even though there were hundreds of animals that, that were affected. But that's because of the laws here in Iowa, um, to where they can only like the laws can only go after one. It was one count of animal neglect for an entire herd or an entire farm. Um, so. There are similar laws like that around to, you know, in some of the other states where just food animals aren't protected the same way that companion animals are, um, which, yeah, so it's, it's, if you're a farm animal in any state, it's just, it's not a safe state at all. Yeah. Yeah, so I just kind of remember to piggyback off that. I was thinking about literally piggybacking, but the pigs come out the trucks. Um, I'm not thinking about standard practice here in Iowa. I'm just curious, and I can't see the industry. Yeah, the uh, so the they the farms and and the slaughterhouses they basically run the the rules. Um, it's like the prisoners running the prison um, because in the laws for when you when you slaughter an animal, there's a caveat of if it's you know you, you can't obviously you know like torture them, but again that's kind of a, a gray area because. In that law, there's a caveat that says that if it's a normal industry practice, so basically, if everybody does it, if everybody's gassing, you know, these animals, if everybody's raising the temperature in these buildings to suffocate these animals to death, then that's not that's not cruelty because everybody's doing it. The industry is doing it. The second that somebody's, you know, you know, doing something outside of that, you know, then that's a little gray area. But if the rest of the industry starts doing the same thing. Is you know, and it can be as abhorrent as they want it to be. But if everybody's doing that, then it's a it's looked down on as like, oh well, that's what everybody's doing, so it's okay. And so that's why a lot of people will do that. They'll they started doing the the closed ventilation to where they suffocate these animals to death with heat. And you know, I mean, to anybody, like that's just cleared and cruelty. If you put a room full of dogs 
you know, in the same position as these, these pigs and these birds, and you suffocate them to death with heat, I mean, the, the outcry would be enormous. But because the farmers do that all the time here, and it's such a normal practice for them, legally they can, they can do that and they can get away with it. But these are the types of things that we try to bring up, and we'll talk about those things at the sanctuary when we have people come out um, to where we can kind of explain that type of stuff to them. Because the farmers do a great job of hiding a lot of the really terrible things they do to animals. Um, especially like on the on the bigger scale, and they kind of ride the skirt of the uh, um, the small farms, where they're like, no, no, we're just a small family farm, but they'll have five thousand animals. You know, it's not a, you know, there's sure there are farms out there with twenty thousand animals, so five thousand isn't a lot, but that is a far cry from being a small family farm of five or six like animals. So, but they they've done a really good job of of muddying the waters for everybody else. Have you ever had any rescues from small farms? Oh yeah, yep, quite a bit. Um, we, uh, uh, gosh, there's um, Emmy and Eli are two of the little uh, the goats that we have um, now. They, they, they're missing portions of their back legs and their ears from frostbite. They were born um, earlier this year uh, when it was like negative 20 in January. And uh, the small farmers that um, they, that had them, they were, they were young, um, it was a young couple, and this was their very first time having um, goats that were pregnant. And they went out, you know, they told us uh, they were going out every two hours that night because they knew it was cold, they knew the mom was going to, um, she was going to have those babies. Um, and so they were going out like every hour, um, every two hours and checking on her outside. And they said between four and six is when they were born, and they weren't out there during that time. So when they went out at six in the morning, um, they found Emmy and Eli, and their legs were pretty much frozen solid at that point, um, just from like being born. Um, not giving them a pass because they were, uh, you know, these farmers are young, and this is their first time. Obviously, these animals didn't have the correct shelter um, or the, the best place for them to be. But they, you know, they did have enough compassion to to reach out to us um, after their vets were like, "Listen, you just need to kill these goats. Like they're not going to survive this." Um, but they they recognize that they're like, well, like there are places out there that can help. So they, you know, fortunately they were able to, uh, to find us and, and we were able to uh, get them from there. Um, we've got a few other goats, uh, Gigi, um, Racer and Ryder. They came from a family farm out in, in Western Iowa. Um, this, this old man, he'd raised like goats his entire life and he was just getting too old and he couldn't take care of them and his kids couldn't take care of them. So they, uh, um, they contacted us and they were just trying to find homes for all of his goats. Um, he had like 20 goats or so. So we were able to rescue those three out of there as well. So not all of our animals come from, you know, big far, uh, factory farms. Um, a lot of them just come from, from small places. All right, guys, well, I think that's my time. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, listening to me around here. <laughs>